this morning before we get things started, but um, as most of you know, um, Jane Rowe's son passed away, Michael. There was a funeral on Friday, and there is um, a need there that we can be a blessing for, and um, there was no insurance. He was an adult. Um, there was no insurance for the funeral, and so there is a great financial need um, that Jane has right now, and so um, anybody that feels led, anybody that feels like they would like to be a blessing to Jane, um, the church will take an offering. Um, if you want to give cash, put it in an envelope, mark it Jane. And if you want to write a check, um, just mark Jane in the memo line. And the church will make sure that that gets to her. But that will go through the church and it will be tax deductible like a gift would to the, to the church so we can be a blessing and meet that need. Um, don't, don't feel obligated, but if you'd like to be a blessing, anything will really help in her situation. So... Um, and with that, um, you know, I know nobody likes to do funerals, but I'm so proud of our pastor, and it was a wonderful message. Amen. And it was perspective that I think all of us can appreciate when we have love someone that we love. Um, you know, I, I just, as I was praying the last few days, things are not as they appear. God keeps telling me that over and over. Things are not as they appear. You know, Nathan talked about there's a departure, right? When someone we, we, when someone we love, there's a departure, they leave. But there's an arrival. We forget so often the other side. There's an arrival of rejoicing, of welcoming, of excitement to see a loved one. And it's so like that in this world. We only see this side of it so many times. Things are not as they appear. The king of glory, things come Sunday, right? The king of glory comes in on the back of a an ass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In 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 no no in humble, in no 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 pomp, no circumstance, they didn't recognize him. The people who had been praying for him for generations, who had been looking for him in every situation, in every moment, in every holiday, in every feast, who had been looking for him. Their own king of glory, their creator, and they didn't recognize him because things are not as they appear. Things are not as they appear in the kingdom of God. We see circumstances. We see situations. We see symptoms of a fallen world. And we're confused and we're perplexed and we're disappointed. Oh, but things are not as they appear. Right. Things are not as they appear. We are victorious in yes. every way. Yeah. We are victorious in every way. We are healed. We are yes. whole. We are yes. holy and righteous. Yes. The word of the song this morning, I, I think I replayed it four times on the way here. And it's called Jesus, Son of God. You came down from heaven's throne. This earth you formed was not your home. A love like this the world had never known. A crown of thorns to mock your name. Forgiveness fell upon your face. A love like this the world had never known. <coughs> you took our sin. You bore our shame. You rose to life and you defeated the grave. A love like this the world has never known. The cross was enough. The cross was enough. But the cross was only one side of the church. Yeah, there was one right. side of it. We focused so much on the cross. But that was only one half of the story. Sure. He died. Yes. Oh, the church, the people around him, his disciples, they didn't understand. Things are not as they appear. Right. His disciples who loved him and were with him and walked with him and touched him and listened to his voice. Yeah. Oh, how I long sometimes to hear his voice. To feel his touch. But they didn't understand and they were with him. Oh, church, he rose. Yes. And then they didn't recognize him when he rose. He walked with them and talked with them. And they didn't recognize him. Oh, we need to open our eyes. He is in 
How are you guys doing this morning? Yeah. God is good. Yes. All the time. Amen. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Donnie Johnson. Uh, Joey, Joey, she's my cousin. Um, you know, most of you know I've been going through a lot of stuff in my life this last year. And uh, it's really taken a toll on my life. And it's got me to almost quit my job. Um, I've just been completely to the bottom. And uh, going from... You know, having a girl accuse me of putting a bruise on her 14-month-old kid, which got dismissed like it should have. Mm -hmm. um, just having faith that God was going to take care of everything. Yes. And uh, just standing on His Word. And uh, I've been going through a custody battle. <clears throat> and it's been going on for a year and a half. And uh, Wednesday... I got a call at 3.45 saying I got full custody of my son. And you have no idea how much that means to me. For you that know me, my son is my entire life. And I knew that I was going to get him. It's just I had to believe that God, it was in God's hands. Yes. And I mean, that is exactly what I don't even know I was worrying or stressing about. Um, I mean, it's just, it hit such a blessing yes. from God that, I mean, I, I brought a strong stability case, and a lot of people was telling me, well, it's not real often that a child, you know, goes with his father in a custody case. Well, God is my ultimate, you know, healer and yes. provider, and I knew that that was not true, and I just stood on the word of God, and I'm standing here today, and I'm so blessed. To be a part of this church and to have you guys in my life and my son, most of all, my four-year-old boy, Kyler. And I'm telling you, I just am a lost words. And I wanted to share this with you guys this morning because God is great. And just stand on the word and believe that things are going to happen and that they will happen. So, thank you. But 
I want the world to know. I want God to know how thankful I am yes. for what he does for us when it doesn't look like there's a way. And I appreciate him so much. I appreciate this church. I appreciate the, the warriors that will stand and that will pray and will bind together. And there's no, um, you know, there's just, there's no uh, singularity. No one's standing up to be recognized. We all want God to be recognized, yes. and that is so evident. Yes. And we're blessed beyond measure. Yes. Yes. Um, I just got a, something, you know, we had a little gathering last night, and something came up, and I know there's a calling on this church to reach out to this community, and I pray that the Lord would draw in someone who has that calling. Um, to reach out to children and the families of this community. I know all those that are in ministry here are, are answering the calling that they have specifically on their life. And I'm not aware of anyone here, maybe the Lord knows, but to reach out, be able to reach out to this community and even in this community of, uh, of believers uh, to work with uh, prayer and, and helping with their home situations or life situations, life crisis situations. It's a calling. And I know if I try to do it in my flesh, you know, I've worked fine for a couple of weeks and I get wore out and tired because it's just the way it does when they're not called to do something. But I'm praying that there would be a person or persons called into our midst that would want to reach out. Our life, our sign outside says community church. So there is a community uh, declaration being made. So I know that the Lord is calling someone here to answer this calling. And uh, so I just pray for that. I was helping a family yesterday with finances and we uh, winded up talking about the Lord and the guy just made something that really impacted me and I want to share it. He says we often look inside and we feel depressed. We look outside and we feel oppressed. But when we look to Jesus, we feel at rest. Woo! And I thought that was just powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really impacted my life. It's like, wow. So everywhere we go, we just need to know Jesus is with us. We can feel at rest. Yes. He's never going to leave or forsake us. Um, and also prayer, continue, please. Those who have heard, my sister-in-law, uh, has they found a tumor on her spine. They think it's probably metastasized from her previous breast cancer, but the Lord's able to take care of it. So just please pray. My brother only got married like a year and a half ago. So, you know, they're still in newlywed, and this is going to be a lot to deal with on their platter. Yeah, yeah. Pray up. Found out yesterday, my aunt Brenda, uh, she went to the doctor a couple of weeks ago. And they found something on her throat here, and they said that it could be cancer. And I went over there last night. We stopped over there on the way home, and you know, she was just like, "Yeah, they found cancer." And I was like, "No, they didn't," you know. And my uncle Kenny was like, she, "You know, she's a weirdo. Just don't listen to her." You know, they didn't find any cancer on her. Oh yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. It's like. You know, I don't know who your physician is, but I know who my old physician <laughs> is. You know, I said, she's like, just pray, you know, for me tomorrow at church. And I said, I definitely will, you know, and you're yeah. healed. I mean, yeah. it's done yeah. deal. So I'm yeah. just keep her in prayers, you know, that she just stays strong. And, you know, I mean, she's going to be healed. That's just the bottom line. Yes. Right. Yeah. 
I say that to myself, to any of those young believers. Uh, my neighbor, like, gave me some hamburgers yesterday, man. It's just been a long winter. You're a drummer. You sound awesome. And I said, because I practice a lot, and I work on the confession of what I believe in. I'm working to help each other each day. That's why I stay at work. That's why I'm focused. And people always said, well, it's different. And I said, well, because I've been drinking the soda pop and just been doing different stuff. It doesn't mean you have to feel like Superman every day. It's like Jesus has got your cave and your pot is at home where you need to be in your Bible and, and your shield of shelter is Jesus. So, Hallelujah. Like I said, the more we relax and not worry about the things of the world, that we need to give it all to Him. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. decided they're going to meet on Sunday morning on their own. And I was a little disappointed because I can't get them to come to church, but they're willing to do that and to have a Bible study, and there's quite a few of them. So I, let's just pray that God will fill whatever, you know. It's this simple. There is not a church that exists on the face of the earth that meets every need That's for right. everybody right. every time. Right. It doesn't exist. Right. So you, all of it becomes what we put into it. Right. But it, sometimes it takes a long time. Yeah. And I don't think anybody here has not been to several churches over, over their mm -hmm. Christian life. You know, mm -hmm. we, we've gone so far here and they... They cease to do what or to feed us anymore. So you move to where you get fed. And then eventually you get to a place where you think, you know, I don't know how much more there is to be fed. I've got more information than I can digest most of the time. So, uh, but it makes me think, Donnie, of what you said, and the Lord's really dealt with me on this, is, uh, you know, just hanging in there. Hanging in there. The race is not to the swiftest, but to him that endures to the end. Yes. Jane and I were talking yes. about that. We said, well, endures what? Life. Yes. Yes. Life. Every day. Amen. Endure. Yes. Because remember this. When God came into time, he had to be so careful, knowing the end from the beginning, sure. that he didn't tip anything. Now follow what I'm saying. At the end, he already saw who was going to accept who wasn't. If he had exposed himself fully, everyone would have believed. And he would have altered what he saw happened on its own. So he had to be very careful. But I want to tell you, our adversary, since the garden, has tried to alter the end. That is his whole purpose. He built, he still believes today, and we're living proof of it, every trial you go through, he is trying to alter the end that God's already seen. And that's why he said, hold fast. Hold fast. We're in a battle, and it affects every one of us differently because
because we have an adversary. Yep. It's been here since time began. Yep. He knows every thought. Not our individual thoughts, but he knows mankind yep. inside yep. out. Yep. And he pokes at you till he yep. finds your weakness. Yep. We all have it. Yep. Mm-hmm. And they're not the same. Yep. He will tempt you with something that if somebody else would laugh at, I don't bother me. Yep. But it's a temptation here. And by temptation, <laughs> I don't mean to sin. I mean to doubt. Yes. Yes. To That's doubt right. God's word. That's yes. right. He will hit us with everything. Yeah. And I know exactly what you're talking about. When people come up and say, there's no way. Mm-hmm. You know, look at look at what your eyes do. They don't give custody to the yeah. dad. Yeah. They just don't do it. And you know, they mean well. They want to prepare you for the inevitable. Yeah. Which, but you did exactly yes. what, what Paul said. Not to the swiftest, yep. but to him that it is. You grab a hold of it, and right. you don't let go of it, and yes. God promises yes. to move. Yes. This kind of goes with what Don said. It's uh, about this church. Um, it just made me think of when I went to college, I went to college to play baseball. And you can see my priorities were all screwed up. I figured that out the first year. Anyway, that's all irrelevant now. It's kind of what, if going from church to church, when you come <coughs> to this church, it, it is home. That's right. It is truth. Yeah. Yes. It is uh, reflection. <coughs> it is rejuvenation. Yes. And, you know, there's from time to time, we, we have uh, friends and so forth or whatever at other churches. And, well, maybe we should go that Sunday and we all come to the, we say, no, we need to come here. And, uh, I don't know, I just, we really appreciate the church body here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
We're going to sing a call, song called Waiting Here for You, but he's already here. Yes. Yes. If there's anything you're holding back, anything that you don't think that has been accomplished yet, just now's the time to lay it at his feet. As Eric said, this is a safe place. Yes. There's no condemnation here. None of, none of us have arrived, but uh, if you're from the 60s, we're on a soul train. <laughs> Hallelujah. Rachel? <Yeah. It's not a matter of if, it's since. They have to tell the person. You're always the last. <laughs>
May her spirit be among those and those that when Jesus was riding in to Jerusalem on a donkey, this being celebrated in Passover. This next song we're going to do, I believe if Jesus was ready to ride in to town, that we would see him on the hill and we would call out his name, Jesus, Emmanuel. God with us. Hosanna in the highest. Cause every knee will bow Every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord forever Every knee will bow Every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord
into your hands I commit again on all I can for you
Hallelujah. Scripture says that many worshipped him for what he did. But the believers, the true believers, worshipped him for who he was. And some saw the acts, and others saw him. So every time we see the breakthrough, every time we see the answered prayer, it's not, a, it's not an act of God. It is an act of God, but it's a manifestation of God. God is our provider, Donnie. God is our healer. Amen. He is our God. He is our, the scripture says he is our everything. Every time he shows up in a manifestation, it's him showing up. It's not just a thing done. It's not just an accomplishment. But it's, the, it's an acknowledging of his very presence in our life. He's here all the time. We have access to all of this, all of the time, simply by faith in him. By believing that he's there to do what he says he will do. And he does it. Amen. Everybody, let's agree together right now with Connie. In the name of Jesus. We agree right now for Debbie and Luke that they are healed. Amen. Your word is the final word, Lord. We know what the doctors have said. We know what the prognosis is. We know what the diagnosis is. But the answer is Jesus. And today we speak life. We release life. He is the life. Praise God. And we release Jesus into this situation, into this circumstance, into their lives, into their bodies, in. And we, we curse the sickness. We curse the disease that has come from hell and we declare it must go back. There is no cancer in heaven. There is no curse in heaven. And we call down the truth of heaven into their lives in the person of of Jesus. Hallelujah. Our Lord and our King. Lord and King over everything, over every disease. That disease has to bow its knee to the very God of heaven. Our healer. Jesus. And we declare it now in that name. In the name that is above every name. So be it. And amen. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for your worship. Thank you again, worship team. It's tremendous, amen. But, you know, when God gets lifted up, this is the result. You think testimonies are just taking up time. I'm telling you, it's through the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony that we are overcomers. Praise the Lord. So it's never a waste of time to be testifying about the goodness of God and what God has done in your life. Amen? Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. When we mix those testimonies with the blood that he shed, yes. we are victorious every time. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank the Lord. All right. Praise God. It's, uh, it's Palm Sunday, right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I have several references to uh, Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the foal of an ass, you know, and the palm branches being thrown out before him. So to, uh, to kind of uh, set up uh, the message I, I want to share with you this morning, I want you to go to John chapter 11, uh, beginning at verse 45. To set this up, though, this is just as Jesus is making a decision to come into Jerusalem to reveal himself. And what has just happened is, and this is the original Palm Sunday, amen, 
And what has happened is Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead. And then we come to this place in uh, John chapter 11, verse 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. So a lot of the people, after they saw this tremendous miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead after basically four days of, death, of being dead, three days in the tomb, that uh, a lot of them, they began to believe uh, what in Jesus because of that miracle. Continue on, verse 46. Uh, but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Now, they weren't going bringing a victory report or a testimony. They were coming to accuse him uh, before the uh, Pharisees. Actually, it was the Sanhedrin is the group that, uh, that he was uh, kind of... Uh, Persecuted by or accused by. Amen. Let's continue on. Verse 47. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we do? For this man doeth many miracles. Now, let's just walk right on down through to uh, verse 53. If we let him alone, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And one of them, named uh, Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Now, he was just talking off the top of his head based on the circumstances, not knowing that he was actually prophesying. He was declaring what God had already declared it was going to happen. Right? And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. Now, he was prophesying, but he didn't know he was prophesying. Mm -hmm. He was just declaring based on, what are you people, stupid? Don't you know? If, if we kill this guy, we'll be saved. You know, our positions, our, our religious uh, hierarchy, our financial gain, everything is going to be held in place. And not for that nation only. He's going to die for that nation, but not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then, from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. Praise the Lord. Now, again, recognize this is, Jesus has just done this tremendous miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. And then he declares to his disciples he's going into Jerusalem and, and to be revealed. The next scene you begin to, uh, that begins to unfold chronologically is he's riding into Jerusalem. They're throwing the palm branches before him and worshiping. And the, and the priests are saying, shut up, shut up. Don't you know this is blasphemy? And, and they're declaring this is God. Amen. Amen. They're not saying anymore this is the Son of God or this is just another piece of God or this is just some... Uh, manifestation or example of God. They're, they're saying this is God has come. Yeah. All that God is, is coming down the street into yeah. Jerusalem on the fold of an ass. Come on. He's proven that that's who he is by the miracles that he's done because no man can do these miracles and they knew that. Right. So here he comes, God writing down. Now, now what sets all this up? The truth is there's more than histrionics at play here. I mean, there's more than us just looking at a historical record and celebrating that and having a, having a Palm Sunday service and then an Easter service. But there's something else that God is doing because everything in this word is prophetic. Everything in the word of God is revealing something not only about what has happened, but what God is doing. I believe that we're at a time that is being prophesied by these very scriptures. Jesus has just taken away the law. He rolled, he said, take, roll away the stone. Mm -hmm. Representing the law, engraven in stones. Right. The law is being removed. He's almost coming to his place of crucifixion where this will be a, a, an actual fact. Right now it's still prophetic in, in the word. He's prophesying these things. He's setting everybody up for what's coming. The Jews understood this to some degree, that it was going to wipe out their control. It was going to take away their ability to manipulate. Think about it. This is, this is coming up on the, uh, on the Passover where millions, literally millions of Jews would come into that city from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And so it was in the, uh, in the ability then of the priests and the hierarchy of the Sanhedrin, 
the Sadducees, the Pharisees, to gouge every Christian that came, or every, excuse me, every Jew that came into that city because they had to have sacrifice. They were literally, they could charge anything they wanted to because they were the only ones that could declare the sacrifices acceptable. Yeah. The, the, the ritual bathing where we get baptism, they're, they're down there cl being cleansed in these ritual baths and they could charge them whatever they wanted to and they could declare whatever they wanted that they needed to be cleansed for. Yeah. So there was no end to the money, the income, that came off of this endeavor. And they knew that, not to mention their prestige and their power and control in everyday life. Yeah. That was all at risk. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is saying, take away the law. The law, once the law is removed, the dead can come forth. Yes. And, he's, and of course, Lazarus came forth still in those rituals, still bound by the religion that put him in there in the first place. And Jesus says, take the, the, the great clothes off of him and let him be free. Set him free. Yeah. That's the scenario. I mean, that's what's being set up here. Jesus is revealed. And when Jesus is revealed in us, truly, I'm talking about grace. I'm not talking about your religious, I'm not, uh, your, your, your thinking how churches are to do this and churches are to do that. You know, I'm not interested. Amen. Because if Jesus doesn't do, do it, it is going to get done anyhow. It's just going to be our labor. It's just going to be what we do. Uh, I've lived this long enough, 30 some years, that I know right. you don't get it done that way. I, I appreciate other people wanting to do and, you know, all that fine. Have at it, praise the Lord. Uh -huh. But I believe that where Jesus is revealed, yes. there's only two things that can happen. And John Wesley said this a long, long time ago. Either people convert or they get angry. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's the truth. And I don't care, you know, I mean, come on, let's face it. How many people have you... Dealt with in your life, and what were the results? Yeah. They either come to Jesus or they get angry. Uh -huh. yes. Praise the Lord. So Jesus revealed Himself. That's what's happening in this last day. That's what's going to happen in this last day. Amen. When Jesus is truly revealed by grace through the preaching of grace, think about this. Yeah. It's no accident that all of a sudden. You turn on Christian television and you can find grace being preached. Maybe not perfectly. None of us are perfect. But, but there's more of it being preached today than I've ever heard in my entire life. Yes. 66 years old and I've never heard it like this. Nope. Now there's plenty of error out there and all kinds of other crazy stuff. But I'm saying there's more of Jesus, the true gospel of Jesus being preached. What he said has to be preached throughout the world before he comes. Amen. It's being preached now. Yes. Yep. And the reason that there is such resistance is because religion is of the devil. Yes, yeah. it is. I'm not saying everybody that's religious is demonic. I'm just saying religion pits itself against yeah. one another. Yeah. You have it in the church itself, in every body. There's in every group of believers. There's people that want to have strife with other people. Yeah, sure. Even if they're not aware of it. Right. They create division. They create strife. They create Amen. Reason for choosing signs. Yes. Sure. That's what religion does on a bigger scale. It's the Methodists against the Baptists. It's the Pentecostals against the, the it's the Pentecostals against the Pentecostals. Uh -huh. Amen. Catholics against this and that. I mean, that's what it does. Yes. And Jesus was pulling down this demonic stronghold. Now, you think I'm not telling you the truth. Look at what the scripture says. How that he overcame. How that he gave us victory. It says he took away the power of the enemy. Yes. And he nailed it to the cross. It was the yes. law. It was the, yes. what the law demanded of us. Jesus fulfilled. Amen. So there was no more need for the law because the law had been fulfilled. Yes. And he nailed that to the tree or to the cross that he was hung on. Yes. Taking away, the Bible says... The power of the enemy. Yeah. The power of the enemy is the law, is the religious rule keeping, amen, and manipulation and control of people. Yeah. Yes. Praise the Lord. I'm doing what I'm doing, not because this comes natural to me. I told my wife that. My wife knows because 
Jane, God bless you, for days leading up to that, I'm, I'm, I'm not fit to be around. Thank God my wife is patient because she don't hear from me for days. And we're in the same house. I mean, I'm not saying we don't talk, but there isn't a whole lot of in-depth conversation. It's because I get so obsessed about the next thing I got to do if it's a funeral. I want it to be right. I want God to be able to move. And I know me. I know left to me, I'm going to screw this up. And there are people that are depending on me, thinking they're depending on me, for God to somehow be revealed. For Jesus to show up and bring some peace or some comfort or some joy or, or some hope. And I'm freaking out because I don't know if I have anything to give them. I don't, and I'm getting in tongues and I'm saying, oh, Lord, you know, you put me in this situation. You better show up. Because it's not about me, it's about them. And it goes to what Mike was saying earlier, and I agree with this. Look, you don't do this in your own strength. And you cannot make other people do it in their own strength. It's the grace of God. And anything other than that is our intellect and our own flesh trying to, you know, thinking that we're going to step in here and do something that God can't do. Praise the Lord. Thank God he shows up. Because otherwise I'd go screaming out of the funeral home. Or when it's a wedding. I'll, I'd, just, I'd go running out of there pulling my hair out thinking, sorry, you've got the wrong guy here. So when I hear Suzanne, you know, say, you know, I'm so grateful for the message. And I, I'm thinking, Lord, it was all afternoon. I'm thanking Jesus. I came over here for the reception. I stayed very, for a very short time just to greet a few people and say hi and so on and so forth. And I went to be with Jesus. To thank him for any positive result of that message. Because I had no clue. Yeah. It's that way every time. Yeah. This, is, this isn't something that I just do because, hey, it's easy to do for me. <laughs> if you believe that, you don't know me. Yeah. <laughs> I go through it every service. Wednesday nights, if there's five people here, I, I go through the same thing if it was going to be 500 or 1,000. Because mm -hmm. I know it is not, and I'm not saying this, please, don't think I'm trying to be humble. I'm being honest. It doesn't come natural for me. It doesn't come natural for any of us. Because in this flesh, there's no good thing. We have to get to the spirit. And that cannot be legislated. It cannot be dictated. It, it has to happen to the individuals. There are people here that will fulfill and can fulfill every office of ministry. Yes. But they won't fulfill it because I de declare it over them. Yeah. Or because I order them into a position or tell you this is what you're supposed to do. It doesn't work that way. Right. They get a revelation. Mm -hmm. They get a place of dependence on God and then they will do it you, depending on God. Yes. Then something can happen. I know, I'm, I know a lot of times people think, well, he just, you know, that's him. He don't care. He's, he's just doing his thing. I care. But I'm not going to live my life frustrated because I can't control everything that happens in the world. I can't even control what happens in my own home half the time. Yeah. Say praise the Lord. Those of you that are have children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Hallelujah. you got to be real at some point. So here's what happens. As we begin to reveal Christ honestly and openly through the grace of God, we're going to get some, there, there's going to be consequences. And the consequences are we're going to be hated and we're going to be persecuted by the world and by the religious. And even by the religious spirits that are in us. Hallelujah. But you know what the result's going to be? The 
greatest miracles we have ever seen. Because it's going to put this back where it belongs in Christ. It's going to take it away from man. It's going to take it away from my ministry, their ministry, this ministry, that ministry. And it's going to put it right smack dab where it has belonged and where it has really has been all along. And that's in Christ. Amen. That's Jesus. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. True revival will be the result. Yeah. Not what we've called revival. Thank God for everything that's happened, but I'm talking about a real revival. Right. A God-sent, God-ordained, God-controlled uh, yeah. yeah. revival. Because yeah. it was like four things were happening at that moment when all this was going on with Jesus on this Palm Sunday. And, and uh, it was what he was trying to reveal and one of those things, the first I'd say was, y'all need help. Y'all need a savior. I mean, that's what he was saying to the religious people, to the unbelievers, to the believers, everybody. He was, right. That was the message he was, he was trying to get out there. Everybody needs a savior. Yes. The religious, the non-religious. Everybody needs help. Yes. Everybody needs a savior. Everybody in here. Yes. When we're really honest, and I'm not doing this to make you feel bad. I, God knows that. I'm not doing that. I'm just saying, if, when we're honest, we know we all need help. Yes. Yes. We need a Savior every day. I don't care how long you've lived for Jesus or how much, how much you know about Jesus. Amen. Because we live in flesh. Yeah. And to, to not see that makes you, leaves you prey to the enemy to use you even when you think you're doing good. Yeah. Because your best is still filthy rags. It's still tainted by the flesh. Yes. And the second thing he was saying was, I'm the help. Yes. Everybody needs help. And I'm him. Yes. Everybody needs a savior. And that's me. Yes. Come on. And that was a threat to religion. Amen. It was a threat to the religion of rules and performance. Yep. And believe me, they knew it. And the reason was it, number four, they were going to lose power, they were going to lose control, they were going to lose prestige. And tell me, I'm just saying, when this thing really unfolds, <laughs> praise the Lord, <laughs> you don't You've got nothing to say about it. You cannot brag or boast of your work. Oh, I did this and I did that and I prayed for this person and I, you know, I fasted and I, I witnessed and I did this and I did that. It's gone. It's gone. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying the time for us to think better of ourselves or less of somebody else based on something we're doing is over. Yeah. It's over. And that's what Jesus was telling them, and they were infuriated by it. Yeah. Because it took away their pride. Yeah. It stripped them of the thing that caused them to feel better about them than somebody else. Mm -hmm. That made them able to look down on somebody else and say, well, you know, they don't do it that's like right. I do it. Right. They should be more of this, or they should be more of that, or they should have this. or they should. Look, I'm not interested. Yeah. I mean, get over it. I don't care. Yeah. And I'm not saying that just to be saying it. I'm saying it because it's true. I got enough to deal with yeah. Yeah. what God wants me to do that I don't feel qualified to do. Let alone worry about what you think I should do. Right. Or what somebody else, you know what I'm saying. I'm not just talking about as a pastor. I'm talking about as we live our lives. Right. God has called you to a destiny. It's your destiny. Don't let somebody else dictate to you what that destiny is. Amen. Let them deal with their destiny. Yes. I'll deal with the prophecies God has spoken to me. Yes. I, that's enough for me to worry about because it hasn't all happened. <laughs> but it has to happen because he said it would. Yes. Yes. I said, what are you so mad about? Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm not mad. I'm just serious. Yes. Praise the Lord. 
Okay, let's, let's move on. Hallelujah. Uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, Sheila, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 23 through 31. First Corinthians 1, 23 through 31. But if but we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Greeks foolishness. So when you preach the finished work of the cross to the religious people, it's a stumbling block because they've already got their performance thing set up and their rules and their regulations, and it creates a stumbling block for them. Yeah. To the Greeks, to the unbeliever, it's crazy. It's just foolishness. Right? But unto them which are called, say, praise the Lord. Praise We're in that number, hallelujah. But them that, that are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Yes. Amen. So whether you come out of a religious background or whether you come out of a pagan background, if you're called, that's what it is. Yeah. That's what it is for us. Hallelujah. That's why it's so hard. It's like speaking a different language when you talk to the unbelievers. And it's the same way when you're talking to, to, to uh, quote unquote Christian, religious Christians. Mm -hmm. It's like you're trying to, you need a translator. Mm -hmm. Because the translator is the Holy Spirit. Yes. Amen. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is what I'm talking about. Uh, it isn't like I've never, uh, you know, done a funeral or a wedding or a special service or something where I didn't feel like I totally dropped the melon, you know, as they used to say. But I have to say 99% of the time God has come through. And when he hasn't, it's been because of me. Rather than depending on him, I thought... If I did this or did that, it would, it would enhance the situation or make it better. And it usually ended up making a fool out of me and not doing everything that everybody else needed. I'm trying to say this in a way that, that you relate to. I know this is what I'm doing. But you're doing stuff every day. I'm not saying be anxious, be uptight, be freaked out like I am. I'm, I'm, that's me, okay? I'm, I'm OCD. That's what I am. So I'm that way in everything, but I, I depend on God. But that's what I'm saying you've got to do. You've got to learn to trust God. You've got to learn to just, it's not about you. You're a vehicle. You're simply a thing that God's going to use, and it's that simple. To think any more highly of yourself than that is foolishness. Now, we are special people, but not because of this. Not because of what we do but because of what he's done yes. and what's on the inside of us. Right. Amen? So you see your calling, brother? Get this. Now, he's already told us that the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Yeah. The weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, hallelujah, I'm in that number, praise the Lord, yeah. not many mighty, not many noble are called. Why? Because they do it themselves. Because they're too good at it. And so God doesn't get the glory. So it, they, listen, when I know it's God, I'm excited. And I know it when I'm doing it, I can tell that God's doing something here because it's not me. I don't have that kind of confidence in me. I don't have that sense of wellness and well-being and it's going to be all right. You know, the next time you stand up, you're not going to trip and fall through the pulpit and you know, break your neck or your glasses or whatever, or make a fool out of yourself or somebody else. No, it's God's, God's working here. All I got to do is stay upright. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. And we all know that because we get into situations and circumstances where we thought we were going to do a certain thing, and then all of a sudden God shows up and we go, whoa, if, if, if you're really listening to the Holy Spirit, you'll just back off and say, okay, Lord, this is working. Yeah. What's my plan, but this is working. Yes. Come on. Amen? Amen? And that's where he wants us. Yes. He's where he wants us individually. That's where he wants us collectively. Yep. Mm -hmm. Dependent on him. Focused on him. Right. Yeah. Amen? So God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Mm -hmm. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. 
This is not to brag. This is just a, a, a history, a, a record of something. I was preaching a funeral for a friend of mine who was involved in politics. And uh, there were people there, uh, big shots in business. People have been in business for years here in the Des Moines area. There were politicians there. There was uh, lawyers. Now, you're looking at a guy who barely got through two years of college. I mean, and I'm talking about, you know, community college. Barely. <laughs> and anybody that knew me in high school thought that was a, a humongous achievement. <laughs> because I thought show up is passing. You know, you get grades for being there. But God showed up. And I had people coming to me, not because they were kind, because I know these people. Mm -hmm. They weren't just trying to be nice. They were trying to figure out what happened. But that idiot mm -hmm. yeah. somehow touched us. Come on now. Because they knew I didn't fit in that crowd. Come on. And yet God put me in a position to be able to reveal him. To them, he took the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Yes. Yes. And that's what he wants to yes. do with all of us. But we got to let him do it. we got to get our plans and our agendas out of the way. Come on now. It takes longer. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It, does. it takes longer for grace to transform people than a rule will. Yep. But when it happens, it's forever. Because it's coming from the inside of what you already are. Not something on the outside that's trying to make you something that you're not. Amen. Come on, that's right. Amen. And it's true of everything. That's why the just shall live by faith. Get that faith. It doesn't take faith to just do stuff because it's been demanded of you or you've been required of it or, or there's some sort of onus over you to do it. That's why I don't like that stuff. That's why I, I get irritated about it. Because I've lived that way. Listen, I was raised that way. Uh -huh. I loved my father. He was a good man, a hardworking guy. Cared about his family, supported us, was you know, did all those things. But he was a lousy father. Because his way of, of, of raising children was to humiliate them. Always raise the bar. Yeah, well, that, that, you never got a pat on the back for doing anything. Even when it was right, it was always something that was left undone. Yeah. Right. So I know what I'm talking about. When I got into church, when I got born again and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it was in a holiness church. God, I love those people. I still do. Lots of friends there. But it was the same mentality. You'll never do enough. When you think you've arrived, there'll be something else. Always keeping you humiliated. Always keeping you in condemnation. No matter how hard you try, you become a hypocrite that way. Yeah. Because you know what everybody else is telling you. Yeah, they're all doing it. Mm -hmm. Deep down inside, you know they're not, but you've got to play the game. Right. Yeah. Jesus has set us free from that. I don't, not, I don't want to bring people back into that. I don't want people to feel that way. You go ahead and screw up. And screw up and screw up. But believe that God has already redeemed you and already made you the righteousness of God and there will a change come. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It'll happen, but that's not what we're looking for. I'm not looking at you to see if you've arrived yet. Because in Christ, and that's what I'm supposed to be seeing when I look out here, you've already arrived. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. Amen? Okay. So, and based... The base things of this world and the things which are despised have God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. This, this is the way God works. It's anti-natural thinking. It's anti the way we would normally think. It's contrary to everything the natural mind works by. Why does he do it that way? So that no flesh should glory in his presence. Yeah. So that I can't walk away and say, whoa, that was pretty good, wasn't it? I'm embarrassed when somebody comes and tells me that was good because I'm thinking, no, don't, please don't tell me that. Because it wasn't me. Yeah. Me, the me that you're thinking and saying was good, 
Just couldn't talk to his wife for two days because he was so freaked out about how bad a job he was going to do. That's the me that you think really did something. And I'm feeling like an idiot for even listening. And I'm thinking, oh, God, because there's still that flaw in me. And I'm thinking, oh, God, please don't misunderstand. I didn't say thank you because I really believed it was me. I just said thank you because I didn't want them to feel bad. Because <laughs> I know it was you. I spent the day off and on. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Thank you for showing up. Yeah. Thank you for bringing some comfort. Thank you for doing something that, that might have helped somebody yeah. who was going through some stuff that I couldn't really understand. Because yeah, yeah. 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 I tried it in the flesh. I tried talking to a couple of the granddaughters. And I felt like such a moron. I finally just had to say, you know, I've been through this with a sister and a brother, but there aren't any words that I can say that's going to make you feel better. There's not any words that I can say that's going to make you feel like <laughs> it'll be all right. Because right now it's not all right, and it's not going to be all right. Right now it's like the end of the world. So what am I doing standing here talking like an idiot? Give them a hug and get out of here. So I know what I'm capable of because when I try it, I just feel it's so feeble. It's so ineffective. Amen. Praise the Lord. But of him, get this, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, and that's the word I want to point out, sanctification and redemption. Now, what sanctification? Well, the dictionary says that it is the fact of being sacred or inviolable, which also I had to look up because I didn't know what that word was. <laughs> it means not to be profaned or cannot be violated, indestructible. That's what he's telling us we are in Christ. You cannot be profaned. Let nobody speak evil of you. You can't be profane. Amen? You can't be destroyed. You cannot be violated. No matter who tries to do it. That's why the scripture in Isaiah 54 says, every tongue that rises in judgment against you, you condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord or the children of the Lord under the new covenant. Because his righteousness is theirs. Yes. Mm -hmm. Praise God. So let's look at 2 Peter now. 2 Peter 3, verse 18. But grow in grace. Praise the Lord. <laughs> That'd be nice to teach sometime in Sunday school or church. Yeah. How do you mature? How do you grow? By giving another list of do's and don'ts. Mm. By giving you a judgment bar of if you get up to here, then we'll, we'll determine that you have grown and now you're a mature Christian. Mm. I said the only way you can grow is just the way I've been talking to you. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because when you grow in grace, that's the result. Yes. Yeah. To him be glory, both now and forever. Yes. Amen. So growth always happens in grace. Real growth, true growth, always happens in grace. Not in self-evaluation, but in the knowledge of Christ. Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 10. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah, Jesus. Colossians chapter 3, verse 10 through 17. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and yes. in all. Yes. Praise the Lord. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, 
holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so forgive them. Yeah. Yeah. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, yes. in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Now I want you to remember this. He's talking about when we when we teach. That word admonish means to instruct, not to ridicule or to berate. So when we're teaching somebody else or instructing somebody else or sharing our the gospel with somebody else, it's telling us how to do it. Amen? With grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him, which is what I've been talking about, yep. without knowing theologically. You see, we, we know all things. We just don't know it under the heading. That we, that we think we're supposed to know it. Uh -huh. In other words, I know that innately, that whatever I'm doing, I have to do it in the Lord, yeah. or I can't do it. Now, I, don't, I wouldn't know necessarily to tell you to go to that scripture, right. but in me, I can know this. Right. Do you understand what I'm saying? As Christians, we know all things. Yeah. So we have an innate understanding of how we are to operate we may not have the theology for it. We may not be able to point you to the scripture. I'm doing this because of this. We just do it because it seems like the only way we can do it. Right. Amen. Amen. So let the, let the word of God dwell in you richly. All right, let's move on to uh, this idea or, or the illustration, really, of uh, what takes place here. This is what Paul's talking about. It is like an illustration of what happens, amen, on the outside when something deeper happens or doesn't happen on the inside. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? I, it doesn't do any good for me to try to teach this to, to your brain. Right. Exactly. Right. It, it has to come to us by the Spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because even if I teach it to you intellectually, you might get it, but you won't do it. But if it comes to you by the Spirit, it'll be a natural way for you to do things. Yeah. You'll learn. It's the only way it works. Yeah. Right? Right. So, I mean, it goes back to what I'm saying. That's why I don't believe in legislating. Do you do this. You do that. You, do, you know, it doesn't work that way. Right. It wasn't supposed to work that way. No. Praise God. See, the work of, of Christian growth it consists in being daily grasped by the fact that God's love for us is conditional. It isn't based on anything we do or don't do. And we do things that imply to people that that is not the way it is. We say we believe in grace and then we do and say things that cause people to think that, hey, God's favor for me is based on what I do. Which negates everything that the gospel's trying to teach us. Right. So when I hear that, I know I'm talking or hearing from somebody who doesn't get it. Right. I'm not mad at them. I'm just saying, look, I'm not, I may not be bright. I may not be the brightest bulb in the box, but I'm not stupid. Right. Although my wife would argue that. I'm gonna, I get to do this because I know I can. <laughs> Men are stupid. <laughs> but women are crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and women are crazy because men are stupid. So it it never ends, does it? That's why we say I don't I, I don't understand her. Of course not. She's crazy, and I can't get through to him. Of course not. He's stupid. He's dead. He's not a woman. Praise the Lord. This is. That's what I'm talking about. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but 
see, sanctification is the hard work of giving up our efforts at self-justification. That's what sanctification really is. It's us not trying to justify ourselves anymore. It's coming to an understanding that I'm justified in Christ. Therefore, I am sanctified. See, all the efforts, all those things are what we are naturally inclined to do. Try to be better. Try to do good. Try to, you know, raise the bar. And that is the very thing that makes sanctification a grueling and counterintuitive. Because the more we're trying, the less we feel sanctified. The less justification we feel because we're failing. The real spiritual growth or progress or maturity or whatever you want to call it, it happens when our typical natural understanding of progress is rooted out. That's the whole message of the gospel. <coughs> Don't think the way you used to think. Get your mind renewed to the word of God. The problem is the word of God has been so polluted with our, yes. our traditions yep. that when we think we're getting our mind renewed to the word of God, we're only getting our mind renewed to somebody else's impression of it or, yes. or some other you know, dogmatic uh, religious kind of way. Okay, look at, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, and we'll go through verse 16. I've I got a lot of scriptures here, but I want you to see this in the Word of God. So, <clears throat> praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 2, beginning at verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, this is Paul talking, came not with excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. But I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, how simple is that? I mean, that's, that's how we are to look at each other. I don't see your faults. I may know them, but that isn't what I'm supposed to be seeing. I see Jesus. I see the finished work. That will help you see it that way. And that will bring it out of you into your life. That's what the preaching of the gospel is supposed to be about. That's why we are to edify one another, not, yes. not criticize and ridicule. Right, right. That's not edification. No. It's something else. Right. So I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Well, we think that means everybody in the auditorium had to fall out. Or shake. That's not what he's saying. He's saying what I was doing was by the Spirit, and that Spirit has power to change people. Yes. Come on. To cause them to repent or change their mind. Right. That's the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. Not how many people fall down in the service. I'm not against that. Don't get me wrong. But that's not what I'm looking for. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. How be it we seek wisdom among them that are perfect? That would be us. That's where we're supposed to be looking for wisdom. Come on. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world in, unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew, for if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord, because what they got as a result of that was a multiplication of the Lord. Yeah. They didn't wipe him out, they just multiplied him. Right. Yes. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man, which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 
But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. That's what I was talking about. Amen. We, we, can, we can look at things and have a decision and a, and a judgment about it and say, well, that's, that may, I don't think that's spiritual. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I mean, anybody ever do that? Yeah. I took my glasses off so I couldn't see if you actually did it. Or not. But, <laughs> but the truth is, we do it. I mean, we don't mean to do it necessarily, but we'll hear something, see something, and there's something in us that just says, ooh, I, I, I'm not so sure about that. You know, we don't, we're not going to say nothing. We don't want to embarrass anybody, but we're, we're making those kinds of judgments. Amen. But the beauty of it is, he that's spiritual judges everything. Because we are spiritual. We have a spiritual sensitivity. But the beauty, the, the obverse of that, which is so great, is that don't judge me. My granddaughter has loved to say that. Jennifer, don't judge me. The truth is, we are not judged of any man. A, a man's judgment means nothing to me. Right. You know, I mean, you know what I'm saying. I mean, right. in eternity. God has already judged me perfect right. because I've been judged in Christ. Hallelujah. So a human judgment is, is irrelevant. Right. You're welcome to it, but it doesn't mean anything. Right. It doesn't have any impact whatsoever. And it's true of every one of you. Yep. You're going to have spiritual discernment. You're going to see things and feel things and so on and so forth. That's the way we are. Mm -hmm. But nobody can judge you. Right. That's free. That's liberating. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. But he that is spiritual judges all things. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Yes. Praise God. So the key to Christian growth isn't first better behavior. It's better believing. Amen. That's why he says, get your mind renewed to the word of God. Believing more deeply, you know, what Jesus has already accomplished. Yes. So what Paul's talking about to the Corinthians is, uh, you know, he's talking to adulterers, he's talking to drunks, he's talking to incestuous people, he's talking to people that are addicted, all kinds of things are going on there. And uh, he's telling them that real change only happens as we discover the gospel continuously. You know, this isn't something you hear once and then go, boom, praise the Lord. I received that. Because everything in the world is counter to this. So you need to hear it continuously. And I've heard the remarks, you know, some certain people have said, well, I, you know, I'm not going today because he's just going to be preaching grace. Well, I'm sorry, but that's the gospel. And that is what we're supposed to be hearing continuously. And if we don't hear it continuously, we have a tendency to immediately fall back into the old zone yes. of what religion and the world does. Condemn, 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 judge, find fault, praise the Lord. So the progress of the Christian life is not our movement toward a goal. Praise the Lord. It's the movement of the goal in us. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Romans chapter 5, uh, 1 through 10. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation work of patience. What do we, how many times do we hear that today? Enduring. Right, Don? Yes. That's exactly what we're talking about. Tribulation, work of patience, patience, experience, and experience, hope. Yes, Lord. You endured. Yes. You patiently, you probably didn't feel patient when it was going on, but you hung in there and believed. Now what happened? The, the result was, now you're going to have hope the next time this comes up. I'm not saying you still won't be challenged, but you've learned if I endure... Something God said will happen. It will come to pass. That gives me hope for the next experience. Praise God. And hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. 
Now that's talking about in the human realm. We know of heroes in the wars, and you hear about, you know, firemen going into burning buildings, or somebody drives by and a child's in the river, and they jump in, to, you know, willing to give their own life to try to save somebody. He said, well, you know, even a good guy will do that for a good person yeah. in the natural. But he said, let me ask you this. Would you do it for somebody you knew was a murderer and a thief and wanted to would, would kill your family as quickly as he as he went down the street? Would you do would you give your life to save them? Come on. Well, God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, yeah. Christ died for us. Yes. Totally different way of thinking and operating than anything that we could do. We think we're really good people because we're doing something, but he's saying, look, a good guy will do something for a good person. And, Maybe for your own family member you give your life, but God did this for total strangers. In fact, he gave his own life yes. for people who didn't want him to give his life, who didn't care if he gave his life. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, if he did that for us, when we were totally enemies of his, what makes you think now he's going to turn his back on us now that we have become believers, even though we still fail. Come on. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved yes. by his life. Yes. Praise the Lord. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we'll be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, yes. we'll be saved. Praise God. So sanctification involves God's daily, sometimes it's minute by minute, attack on our unbelief. Uh -huh. Our self-centered refusal to believe that God's approval of us in Christ is full and final. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Praise God. It happens as we daily receive <coughs> and rest in our unconditional justification. Yeah. Sounds too good to be true because it, it, it's just not natural. Amen. Okay, 1 Corinthians 1, verse uh, 30. We're about done here. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1 and 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Remember? All right. The heart of sanctification is the life that feeds on justification. <coughs> Are you with me? Mm -hmm. the, the, the way you live your life sanctified is by staying focused on the fact that you've been justified. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Just as if you'd never done anything wrong. Uh -huh. yes. That's where our sanctification comes from. Yes. That's what our sanctification is. All right, verse 31. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. In other words, when we stop focusing on our need to get better, mm -hmm. that's what it means to get better. Or when we stop spending more time thinking about us yes. than Jesus. Right. 2 Peter 3.18, grow in grace, right? Yes. How? Well, let's just consider the, the words that Jesus shared. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 26. How do we do this? <clears throat> Behold the fowls of the air. They sow not. You know, we, we always think of this as a natural stuff, you know, that you're going to get. Well, that's true, but there's always parallel truths. Come on now. There's something on the surface, but there's always something God's trying to reveal to us as well. Yes. Behold the fowls of the air. They, don't, they sow not. Yes. Neither do they reap. That's right. Nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Yep. In other words, he's saying they don't do nothing for what they get. Yeah. God just doesn't. Behold, okay, move on to 27. We'll go down through 33 eventually. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow. All right, 
Which of you taking thought can add one cubit into his stature? You're not going to change yourself. Not in height. We, we recognize that as something that's impossible. Because most of us uh, going through school, we wanted to be 6'4", 6'5", or whatever. We, want, we tried. If we could have made ourselves, you know, the center on the basketball team, we would have. But we couldn't. Not, not for lack of wanting it. I know people that got on these stretching things. Guys that went to work for the fire department when they had a height requirement, and they would go and get on these racks, basically what were torture instruments during the medieval times, and get themselves stretched. If they could stretch themselves a half or three quarters of an inch long enough to get in there for the, for the physical, they could get on the fire department. But anyway, you're not going to do that. You're not, you can't do that. You can't make yourself taller. Well, you can't make yourself better. That's the real meaning here. That's the real, what he's trying to tell us. And why take you thought of raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, now let's get a spiritual perspective here. What do the lilies of the field do? Nothing. Nothing. And yet, they have been clothed. What does the scripture say about us? He has given us a robe of righteousness. Yes. We, have been re we have received a white robe. Yes. He has clothed us with righteousness, and he clothes us with that righteousness. Without us doing one stinking thing. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, O ye of little faith, O ye of eternal life? Yeah. Praise God. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what wherewithal shall we be clothed? In other words, quit worrying about. I mean, how can I do this? How am I going to be that? How am I going to be able to manage that? How am I going to grow up and be that better person? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. That's why Jesus provides them. But seek ye first. Get it. This is the this is the climax of all the stuff that he's talking about. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. His righteousness, yes. not your righteousness. His righteousness. Yes. And all these things get added to you. In other words, everything that you need, all your growth, all your maturity, all of your wisdom, all of your it all comes simply by seeking His righteousness and not our own. Oh. Amen. I am the vine. You are the branch. The branch doesn't do anything but hang there and receive from the vine. Yes. And what's the result? Fruit. Yes. The, the branch gets to carry the fruit, but it doesn't do anything to make the fruit show up. It just stays connected to the root. It's not doing anything. The root's doing the work. Yes. Praise God. This all leads to somebody. Amen? There's something that's produced by God's grace. And that something is your maturity. <laughs> That's what he's telling the Galatians. Oh, foolish Galatians. Ha having begun in the spirit, now you think you're going to perfect this somehow by going back to the flesh? Amen. Our maturity comes, we grow by grace. That's the only way you can grow spiritually. Full, complete maturity. A couple more scriptures, we're done. Ephesians 4, uh, verse 13. I'm saying just let's forget about it. Yes. Just trust God. Yes. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Uh, just keep going, if you will, Sheila, right through verse 24. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. See, that's what, that's what religion ends up doing. Yeah. By the slight of men and cutting craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speak the truth in love. May grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. How does the body increase? By grace. Yes, yes. Yes. 
This I say, therefore. Now, it don't, it don't increase as quickly as we want it to increase. Let me talk to somebody that's my, you know, in my age range here. Don, has everything God promised you come to pass? Have you given up? No way. We're there. That's, that's what I'm talking about. It's the same way with me. Well, he works with a body the same way he works with an individual. He doesn't have one thing for this and something else for that. I'm not saying we shouldn't be praying. I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing what we can do to influence people. But I'm saying when it happens, it happens by grace so that no man can get the glory for it. Well, look at how many I brought in. Because that's what happens. I'm sorry. That's what human nature does. Not that we're not grateful. But it's his church. Not yours, not mine. It's his. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Uh Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. That's not talking about jumping somebody's bones or having some you know, perverted sex thing. It's talking about Operating from the flesh. But you have not so learned Christ. You didn't learn Jesus that way. You didn't get Jesus by doing something. You got it by believing something. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after God has created, in righteousness and true holiness. Praise the Lord. Amen. So Paul brings up this full maturity, and he does it again in Colossians 4.12, where you don't have to go there, Sheila. That's talking about Epaphras, but that's what he's doing. He's praying. He says, he's got such a heart for you guys that he wants you all to grow up and be perfect. And he's talking about the same thing. Because he speaks about it again then in Philemon 6. There's only verses in Philemon. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. I mean, look at this. The communicate, how do you communicate your faith? It, 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 it becomes effectual. The way your faith is effectual, the way it has an impact on people, is when you acknowledge every good thing that's in you. Yes. So how can you, how do you think that people are going to bring increase? I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking about religion in general. We, this is what we teach them. You've got to get out there and knock doors. You've got to hand out tracts. Well, listen, if you're operating from a mindset of your uh, fatalism, you know, your failures and your, your lack of success and your fleshly, uh, you know, screw-ups and, and quote-unquote sin, whatever you want to call it, you're not going to impact anybody. Right. The way you affect people is by acknowledging every good thing which is in you in Christ. Yes. Yes. You'll have greater impact by accident yes. when you believe who you are in Jesus than you ever will on purpose when you're out there doing it under some oppressive, God, i got to do this, or God's not going to bless me, or, or God's not going to like me, or, you know? Praise the Lord. Paul wants us to know that the comprehensiveness of the everything in Christ. In other words, it covers every part of your life. It's comprehensive. It's complete. It's everything. Romans 15 and verse 14. I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Now that's interesting because in in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, just before what we read earlier, you don't have to go there simply for for the sake of time. But he says, so that the Spirit gave us apostles, pastors, you know, preachers, evangelists, so on and so forth. You know the scripture. Why? To edify, to build up, and to instruct. Now, who's he talking to here? He's not talking to me. 
I mean, he is talking to me because I'm a Christian, I'm a believer. But he's talking to everybody. Amen? Go back to uh, uh, 15, 14. Because he said, I'm persuaded also of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness. That acknowledging the fullness of goodness, filled with the knowledge of it, see, full, we're filled with knowledge, able also to instruct one another. Yeah, right. Yeah. He says, we're all priests, we're all kings, we're all teachers, we're all pr to prophesy, to prophesy <laughs> and to preach. Yeah. Right. Right. And how do we do it? How do we get this thing that he's talking about in Ephesians? We get it this way. You don't get it just from here. You don't get it just because somebody runs around saying, I'm an apostle, or I'm a prophet, or I'm a this, or I'm a that. We can say anything. Right. The proof is in the pudding, you know? It's in the goodness of you that you have the ability to instruct one another. Yeah. Praise the Lord. James 1, uh, verses 3 and 4. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Amen? Amen. How? Praise the Lord. The trying of your faith worketh patience. Let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, Donnie, that's exactly what happened. And then Don testified. See, the spirit knows how to operate in a body. Yes. But if you'll notice, everything that was said here edified. Yes. 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 It encouraged. It lifted up. There wasn't any rebuking about, well, you shouldn't have, you know, you shouldn't have questioned. My God, if you didn't question, you wouldn't have any flesh. The unbelief is in our flesh. It's not in our spirit. Our spirit believes everything. This is total agreement. It has the mind of Christ. Our flesh is what questions. And Paul said, so then if I sin or if I'm in unbelief, which is what sin is, then it's not me that's sinning, but it's sin in my flesh. That's why when we come together, you don't hear that, do you? Right. Why? Because the Spirit is moving, and people are speaking one to another, and the Spirit speaks expressly the way God does, because it's His Spirit. And what does it do? It edifies. It encourages. It makes you believe it's possible. All things are possible. And how did that happen? Because somebody endured. Somebody persevered. Somebody was patient. And the result was he's got a testimony. That's right. And the blood of the lamb made it possible for that testimony. That's right. And mixed with that blood, we get it. And the answer and the result is we become perfect, entire, wanting nothing, meaning everything has been provided. Yes. Whether it's your son. Yes. Amen. Whether it's financial breakthrough, whether it's a new job, whether it's a healing, whatever it is, it happens by believing in the goodness of God. Yes. And that he has declared us goodness. Amen? So how? Look at, let's look at Colossians again, chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. What is it? We're dead. This flesh, God, that we're talking about that sins, that has unbelief in it, God reckons it to be dead. He doesn't deal with it. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Jesus and the love of... No, it's, it's uh, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God, which is where we started all of this in the beginning, right, this morning. This morning. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. If you reckon yourself to be dead, dead he shows up. Right. He appears. Yes. And something glorious can happen. Yes. Amen? Amen? All right. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verse 43, and this is the last scripture. 
1 Corinthians 15 and verse 43. Talking about the same thing he was just talking about in Colossians chapter 3. It is sown in dishonor. This body. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. Hallelujah. What did he say? Jesus said, the seed has to fall to the ground and die. Amen? We are Abraham's seed. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating dying daily the way we have, most of us have misunderstood that, that scripture. I'm saying we are dead in Christ. And when we are dead in Christ, <coughs> we were sown in dishonor. We were sinners. We've already read the scriptures. So we died in dishonor, but we are raised with him Hallelujah. in newness of life, by faith, by belief, and we are raised in honor. Mm -hmm. We're now honored by God. We're now the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. We were sown in weakness where we began. Everybody needs help. Yes. Everybody needs a Savior. Why? Because we're all too weak to keep all the rules. Right. Right. So we're sown in weakness. God knowing our inability to do this. Right. He did it. So that we can be dead in Christ and be raised in power. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. The, the power of God will be released and the revival of God will be released when we are acknowledging that we are dead in Christ. And there is goodness in us. There is grandeur in us. There's power in us because of being in Christ. Because when we got in Christ, Christ got in us. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. It's all covered. Yes. Our past, our present, and our future. Thank you, Jesus. So grow in grace. Hallelujah. I told Sally, I want this song at my funeral. Don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm serious. I'd, I'd be the happiest, amen, in heaven when I hear Bob Marley or, you know, Farron. I don't care who does it, but don't worry. Be happy. Praise the Lord. That is a gospel message in, in its simplest form. Don't worry. Be happy. He's got it covered. It's all taken care of. It is finished. Give him a hand clap. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Well, God bless all of you for being here. appreciate you coming out on this day, but I'm so happy for the testimonies yes. and excited about what God is doing yes. and believing for even greater, yes. amen, more powerful moves of God in each of our lives and in our right. lives collectively as well. So God bless you. Have a great week. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.